three, two, one, zero, zero, and liftoff! Welcome to Mission Control, Peralta Design's podcast on all things branding and digital marketing. Since 2008, Peralta Design has launched hundreds of brands with award-winning identities and websites. Join our hosts Ramon and Jorge as they use decades of combined experience to tackle topics with past clients, industry partners, and the rest of the PD crew. At Peralta Design, we launch brands. But for now, let's launch right into this episode of Mission Control. Hey everybody, welcome to Mission Control. This is Ramon Peralta. I'm founder and creative director at Peralta Design and we thank you for joining us here on Mission Control, which is uh, Peralta Design's official podcast on everything branding, marketing, technology, today football, and maybe a little bit of movies. And and I'm very excited. I've got my co-host back, uh, our director of web development, Jorge Pezo Candelario is here. How's it going, everyone? Well, good to be back. Yes, it's good to have you back, my co-pilot. You you really look like a co-pilot with the uh, the headset on. <laughs> You're gonna fly away any minute now. So maybe, maybe Danny can throw in some chopper. Uh, sound I'm gonna get in pull, it, pull the chopper. Out. <laughs> <laughs> so, just be just just hit your chest like the old uh, news. Yeah, news yeah, report, yeah, right, exactly. The news reporters and so that and that that voice that uncanny, unique. Uh, amazing voice is one of one of my dear friends. One of my you know we go way back, and I, I'm really really excited to have him on our show. It's it's none other than the one and only Mike Patterson. So welcome, Mike Patterson. Hello, hello, hello. It is a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me, man. <laughs> yeah, this is this has been so overdue, uh, a long time coming. So, man, I remember when I first when I first met you. Uh, and I, I'm gonna these things. You know, there are certain things that that are filed away in the vaults right. and then there are certain things that that we're gonna we're gonna you know uh go into but i remember at the time i think it was called skill games right uh, it was right after like you know you guys were in the woolworth building yeah yeah the bubble and, the bubble and uh yeah. and the, the, the yeah the bubble burst and oh my uh, God. <laughs> bubble burst and uh <laughs> yeah right right after that you know everything went crazy with 9 11 but yeah, this was a you know there was impending doom either way. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people forget about those crazy days of the you know the nineties where it was just like, hey, you got an idea? Here's a couple right. million dollars. I can't imagine a startup company in the Woolworth building. Like if you yeah. think about it now, it's so exactly. absurd. It's, it's absurd. So, it's so absurd. <laughs> Although I mean, some of the things that are still going on now with these startups is ridiculous too. Like these WeWorks, but they're yeah. like palatial. Right. So you know, and they have WeWork is a startup. Yeah, they have like kombucha fountains and <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly so. Yeah, some of the culture has really changed. I don't know mm-hmm. that we all get to learn to uh, learn too much that way. But interestingly, yeah. that's kind of why I've I've kind of rethought about what I'm going to be what I'm doing with the rest of my career. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I remember that. And so, so Jorge, you know, as a gamer, uh, I think you have a lot in common with Mike, uh, Mike's past with gaming. So you, you, you did come from gaming. Yeah, yeah, my background Absolutely. is gaming. Yeah, 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 my background is gaming. So uh, as a developer got, or as a uh, uh, well, I, like, well, I started it. I started in QA. Uh, so oh, okay, uh, which is which kind of led me to the rest of my career. So I, um, previous to that, this is probably 1994. Like probably like 1994, uh, for the probably five years before that, I've been trying to be a rock star, basically, and uh, <laughs> a literally a rock, like star. literally a rock star. Yeah, yeah, I was in a touring rock band, went you know, up and down the East Coast. Uh, what do you, you play? Had blonde hair. Yeah, yeah, I had blonde hair. Wow, um, <laughs> leather pants that I got from my grandfather. <laughs> it's, it's a true story. Uh, and yeah, yeah, we were playing a lot of places up and down the East Coast. And uh, what do you, uh, just, what do you play? Uh, I'm, I was always the, I was always the lead singer, but I play guitar. And oh, I always I was uh, I always wow. saw music as my reason to write. So that's what I did primarily was write. Uh, so I was uh, I was kind of coming to the realization in about 1994 that maybe I need to kind of throw that in the back pocket. Uh, so I was actually working at a bar at the time. A friend of mine who worked for Acclaim Entertainment was like, "Hey, I know that you're a gamer." And we're, we have this QA group. Why don't you, why don't you just give me your resume? And let me see what's up. 
so that's how I started. I went, so the way they did it back then, you know, there was no, you know, there was no course, you know, there was no kind of course uh, direction <laughs> for, uh, for getting into gaming. It was snag it as you go. Uh, what they would do is uh, like a two-day trial, right? So they go, put you in front of a, of a prototype of a game, and that was buggy. Mm-hmm. And then and then give you this way to communicate uh, with the developers. Uh, so literally after the first day, the the guy who was in charge said, "What what did you do before this?" <laughs> I just kind of like <laughs> because I was just like I was a guy who all you know English is my background, yep. and so I was communicating in the way that I knew how to the audience. I knew how, uh, so that's how I got started. But um, I kind of took to it like a duck to water to that. And within the next couple of years, uh, you know, the way Acclaim Entertainment was set up was like Acclaim is the publisher, and we had uh, satellite development studios all over the world. Yeah, very common. Yeah, right. And each of those places at the time had their own QA department. And I was like, okay, this is crazy. Um, so I basically took over the department and built a worldwide kind of connector and put all the QA departments together and made it run through the development house. Um, so that's how really, that's kind of how management and, uh, and my career kind of got started. So Do you have like, can I see your name on any, are you credited on any, oh, any yeah. titles? Everything, man. Oh, yeah. um, what, quarterback can you share club. any of that or is that all under NDA? No, no, it's not NDA. NDA is back then. <laughs> it was free for all, man. Uh, no, uh, quarterback club 98. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Tour out the dinosaur hunter. Wait for uh, what? Like for console? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude. Okay, so at that time, so again, like I said, it's 1994, 1995. We did the first. You know, that was at the end of the Genesis era, and just at the beginning. Play PlayStation. When I first started, PlayStation dev systems were just coming to houses. Wow. And so we were doing the first. Oh, this is the start of 3D. You know, yeah, it's the it's the it's the, the start of disc based. You know, so it was that. Uh, you know, the Saturn, uh, you know, and we did, and we had a lot of titles. So, um, yeah, man, I was on like Iron Man XO. Uh, there was a Spider-Man title. Um, I mean, dude, I can't, so much stuff. Mary-Kate and Ashley, we did those. We did the first, <laughs> I'm to imagine. we did the first, uh, yeah, the first South Park games. That was on the N64. Um, yeah, Breakaway, NHL. I mean, I got a long list of stuff yeah. in the and the six years I was there, I, I mean, <laughs> damn near a hundred times. Wow! So, so Mike, when 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 we met, you had you were at Skill Games, which was a Walker startup, right? Which became I, w- I think I was at Conversion Marketing, which was another spinoff that, right. that came out of one of Paul Breitenbach's, uh, you know, concepts with with Jay and. But when you guys moved, like I, we had like this team that was in New York City, which were you guys in the Woolworth Building, which was very like a very voluptuous palatial place with you know you guys had the air on chairs and like carbon fiber. Yeah, it was know, ridiculous. Conference yeah. tables and stuff. A cathedral in the in, a cathedral in the in, yeah, in exactly. the bottom floor. Right. So so you guys you guys come back. I think it became ring toss. Then it becomes hometown prices, right? Correct. Yeah. Well, ring, well these, I don't think. It was all these changes, right? It was, it was basically, Jay had kind of, was trying to think about what to do with this group of talent that he had left over from Skill Games, which I remember as a concept, was supposed to be Walker and Disney doing games of skill for cash prizes. Right. The idea being that you could kind of sneak in gambling without really gambling. Uh, <laughs> and, and basically... That concept was coming to to start to crumble anyway. Well, that's right. the that's the clutch, right? Like if it's a game of skill, right? Then it's right. Not gambling versus right. a game of so chance. we were we yeah. were in that line back then, like right, right. And so after nine eleven, uh, which you know, so the Woolworth Building, just so for people who don't know, is pretty much directly across the street, uh, uh from from the World Trade Center, from the old World Trade Center, and um, so and that's where our offices were. So after nine eleven. They brought us into the headquarters of the parent company, which was Walker. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I don't know, I think there were like 30 of us or something. Yeah, I, you guys all fit like in the lobby. We were, I remember being yeah. in one building and you guys were all there. You all guys were like 
I don't know what it must have felt like for you guys because you guys were all like city dwellers coming into like Stanford now. Yeah, yeah, it was it was wacky because I yeah, yeah I lived in the city, and I was like, oh man, reverse. I mean, commuting to Stanford, to yeah. Stanford every day, it was like crazy. <laughs> but when we got there, uh, Jay really kind of did his best. I feel like mm. to try to come up with a reason to to keep this talent right. You know, I mean, we all knew that it was going to get sliced off at some right. point. Right. But to, to, to kind of keep this talent, uh, uh, this talent pool together and kind of come up with something. So that was the great thing about working for Jay is that he's always coming up with something. Mm -hmm. So he extrapolated out this idea. I know that Ring Tufts, they, they still wanted to kind of do games of skill for cash prizes, <laughs> um, you know, which was problematic, obviously. Mm -hmm. And Jay has kind of these, these, uh, these true, these time and true thing he always likes to do. There's always like they resurface. Credit, yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, there's like a credit card angle. Yeah. Uh, there's always like a, a coupon angle. Um, so he likes to kind of <laughs> he likes to kind of you know <laughs> reuse some of his ideas and throw them out to a new bunch of talent to see what would come out of it. Right. So ring toss was something that was an idea, uh, but it never really stuck. And then we actually got some real momentum for a while on the hometown prices, right? Right, and that was fun because you and I got to work with. Uh, I mean, there were some some really cool illustrations that were done. Yeah, and and uh, it had promise. Yeah, the I, heyday I, of uh, the heyday of Adobe. Uh, yeah, Adobe yeah. Illustrator. Yeah, Ado yeah right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was fun, and the idea that it was going to roll out nationally never never quite. And I remember one one of my funniest stories uh, was Kevin Kevin Kerwin. He, he, right. he used to work there. We we. Uh, we ended up like download. We played the game and we downloaded like a a, a coupon from IHOP to get like a, to get like a burrito or something like a, an omelet or some crazy like lunch dish, like buy one get one free or right. whatever it was. So uh, so we print out the coupon and we go down we go down to the IHOP there on on Summer Street in Stanford, and uh, I don't know how it worked out, but I think we both ate lunch for like a dollar or something like that. I don't something something stupid. And, uh, and, and when we told uh, Matt, uh, Paul's brother, about it, he was like, wait a minute, that's not how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to, like, <laughs> buy other things when you go there. And, and, and we were like, yeah, we were right. like, yeah. Yeah, there was kind of a hole in the concept. Right, um, exactly, I, exactly. And, you know, that's <laughs> everybody's going to do. I mean. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, we had those conversations. It was just like, yeah, just so, like, people may not understand. So the concept of the hometown price is right yeah. was – um, we had created um, Flash, Adobe Flash versions of the games that were on The Price is Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, a, what a time to be alive. Like, oh, my God. God. It was They're awesome. To, uh, like, Chrome was about to shut off yeah. Flash. This, well, this and music. back then, but, Flash right. was, that was the cutting edge. I mean, you right, couldn't do, the, the without Flash, right. we would not have been able to do the stuff that we actually did. Right. <laughs> and we were actually really kind of innovating at the time. Nobody else was really kind of doing games like that on the right. internet. Um, so it really was an innovative group. But the idea was you'd play the games almost exactly like they were on the, on the prizes, right? And the prizes were these coupons that you were supposed to use locally. But the whole idea about how you were supposed to use them was that you weren't supposed to be able to use them. Unless it, it was like you buy something and then you use this coupon and you get it. But I guess a lot of the, the – <laughs> I got a lot of retailers didn't really understand that. And, uh, yeah, there was a problem in communication there. Um, yeah. But it was fun. And we extrapolated that out to the other uh, other uh, game shows. So we had Card Sharks. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had a bunch of other, like, game shows that we were using under this whole banner was Game Show 24. Yep. And, uh, and the hometown price is right. Was, was one. Yeah, I think I still have a bucket hat of Game Show 24, but there was never a shortage of swag and, and, yeah, right? and, and money being spent there. There but, you go. Oh, my God. So uh, so fast forward, because we, uh, Jorge and I, we remember working with you for a brief minute um, at Life in Mobile. So, you, you, you know, you know, Walker, we all know the story, went into gaming and, and so forth. But let's fast forward to, like, tell, tell us a bit about how you've started Polygon Dropout, um, what you're doing there, and how you ended up working with, with the guys at Life and Mobile. So um, so after, I, I was at Walker for a dozen years, for maybe for like 12 yeah. years with Jay. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I had to, I, you know, I was starting to do some, I'm getting older, just do some evaluation, like, I'm getting older, like, uh, I don't want to work for somebody forever. 
um, you know, maybe it's time to strike out on my own. So um, primarily a lot of what I did for Jay was prototyping. Mm -hmm. So it was like, he would have an idea about something that he'd want to do. And then I put something together with a team that would be an approximation of what this idea would look like on the web or in a, in an app or something like that. It was like, right. you know, there's a lot of people out here with ideas. Why don't I, why don't I try and use my, you know, but the talent pool that I know and, you know, my expertise and put, uh, to put together a company that, uh, that does that. And so I started a uh, Polygon Dropout as that concept. Um, and that concept worked for a while. You know, we got, uh, we got to put a lot of people's ideas together. Um, but it became clear that I needed to kind of take it to the next level uh, because one of the things that I touted, that I touted, because we were using Flash and things like that, one of the things that I touted about using prototyping as a way to get your idea across was that you could cut out the middleman of trying to describe your product to development um, because you see it in full regalia. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, that works as a concept, but, you know, once you hand it off to somebody else, the lot can get lost in the translation. So it became clear that I had to start it to take it to the next level right. Right. and be like that if guy. Not, if you were, if it, you don't execute on the promise of the prototype, then. Right, right, right. What I wanted to, the concept was I was out after the prototype. Like that's what the concept of the thing was. But uh, it became clear that I, in order to kind of try and make it more of a success, I needed to take it to the next level. And so I started working with Life and Mobile because I was doing, I had gotten at that point in the process. Mm -hmm. So we were, I had been working with them on a couple of projects like that, some game for Dunkin' Donuts that they were doing, uh, and some other projects. And I, you know, executed the games, uh, you know, kind of fully with them. So we had had a good working relationship uh, as partners. Uh, for a while, just me, me working with them in that capacity. And then um, one day, uh, Lim came kind of came up and was like, hey, listen, I have some things that are coming up here. Um, why don't you think about, you know, coming over? And I'm like, well, I have a company. Mm -hmm. um, and so we kind of worked out this idea where they would were you still independent, but you were in their building, or did you become well, yeah, an employee? Well, yeah, I was. I, well, so that's how it, we came up with this idea that I would kind of come in, fold my company into theirs, and bring my clients. Okay. Uh, and bring my clients in, and we would have kind of a full service shop, with me doing prototyping and my clients, and then having their developers take over the development part gotcha. of those ideas. Gotcha. Because yeah, he had a team overseas, uh, Poland, Poland or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was okay for a couple of years. Yeah. Didn't, it didn't... Uh, I, well, I remember it, going down there and, uh, to, to meet with Pax and seeing... seeing and you weren't in that particular day. I don't know if you were in on... You had a certain schedule, but we right, remember yeah. seeing, seeing your spot there. And, and yeah, and yeah. Yeah, and it was... It was, uh, it, it, was uh, it was fruitful for a while. Yeah. And in fact... You know, obviously the connection's always been me and Pax. Uh, and me and Pax have, you know, always kind of brainstormed. I know yep. that you guys have too. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we always still have irons in the fire. Um, but at that, that, I mean, uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That thing did not turn out the way right, I wanted it. Right, 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 right. Let's leave it there. Yeah, let's leave yeah, it there. Yeah, yeah. And today, are you, st is that, does Polygon drop off still, is this still what you're doing, or what are you up to these days? What's, what's kind of a fun project you're <clears throat> working on now? So, uh, so it's interesting. So Polygon Dropout still exists, but I am not giving it my main attention. Okay. Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't, uh, that it doesn't churn out. So we just finished a massive overhaul of JASA.org's website. Um, it was, uh, it was a, it was a, Project that probably about a year in the uh, a year in the making wow. uh, that we just landed, just finished, and we're real proud of it. You should go check it out at jasa dot jasa dot org. Uh, it's a great organization, also. Um, so uh, yeah, and I still have clients um, that you know I still have to do ongoing work for, yeah. uh, but I made a decision, especially I mean kind of over the last couple of years, 
uh, that I, it's startup culture is just, it's just not, it's not where I want to be, man. It's not, I don't, I, I'm not crazy about where it ended up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not crazy mm -hmm. about the culture of it. Yeah. Um, like I, I, I feel like it's, I feel like it's predator and prey generally with it. And I feel like, I feel like in my experience, at least in the last few years, the, um, you know, the two sides that are at the, at the, at the heads of these yeah. are just kind of predatory. Like it just makes me, I'm kind of, I don't want to spend my life doing that. Right, 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 right. Uh, I hear you. I, I, it's funny. I just got off, I just got off a of zoom with, with, with Scott Casey and, you know, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So with Upside Travel, he started this like founders forum every week where he pulls entrepreneurs together. It's quite genius pivot because nobody's really traveling as much now. Yeah, right, right. So, uh, so and today's topic was on race uh, and, and black entrepreneurs and black startups. And, and he's really taken over the last month or so, really taken to uh, a lot of his content uh, has been about uh, e equality and, and opportunity and allyship. And so today we were talking about allies. That's awesome. Good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that that's, uh, that that's yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. yeah, it is. And, and, uh, so on that note, I, I want to switch gears a bit because we, we, we there, I, I just got to say, I absolutely love the, you know, being connected with you on social media. <laughs> the, last, the last three years, uh, you know, I don't want to get your pain bodies all, you know, in, in a fritz right now, but you know, you, you have taken upon yourself to engage with the occupant quite often <laughs> on, on Twitter. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, <laughs> I can't help myself, man. Sometimes, sometimes I just like, I, I keep saying to myself, I try to keep talking to myself logically and be like, you're just, you know, you're just throwing, you're spinning, you're spinning into the wind, yeah. but I can't help it, man. Oh, yeah. the occupant, that dude. You know, they painted Black Lives Matter right in front of Trump Tower. Like, yeah, today. I know. I got a picture on my <laughs> social media already. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, genius troll. Oh my God. You gotta love it. <laughs> it's just fun. I get. Oh, good. No, no, no. Go, for, go for it. <clears throat> I mean, it's just. It, it's kind of sad, but it's also kind of inspiring to see that <laughs> you know the powers that be when they act crazy. The only way to freaking act back is crazy. So it's just like, all right, you want to be an unhinged maniac? I'm going to paint Black Lives Matter in front of your house. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just like, <laughs> all right, man. You know. Crazy is as crazy does. I'm with it. Yeah, we. Tr I think we all tried taking the high road, and that just wasn't that just wasn't working. Nothing was happening. Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely so, nothing. On that note, uh, with everything going on, uh, and I know Jorge's chopping at the bit to talk about football because we're big football fans. I know oh, you're yeah. a big Jets fan, unfortunately. Yeah. Yes, uh, life, a life fan. <laughs> <laughs> what? Tell me what? I mean, the the, the 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 is this the black national anthem being sung, is this all pandering? Because I mean, if, if they're still funneling money towards the Trump campaign, what good is, is having, uh, I mean, and we know how, how Kaepernick was vilified through this whole process. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your well, thoughts as a black man, specifically a football fan uh, about all of this that's happening? Cause it well, seems uh, like they're trying, but I mean, is it really doing anything? Well, I mean, <laughs> you, you get into the whole thing about motivations, right? Um, so it, it, it's not like Kaepernick was a lifetime ago. Well, I mean, we're, even as, even as late as last year, we're still talking about the vilification of this man, um, by these teams in a way, in a manner that is really kind of just out of step. So when you see what's happening now, George Floyd made a big thing happen and people started to reach out to these where the money is, which is the advertisers, and the advertisers are coming back down on the league. Mm -hmm. They have to, because that's where the money is. Now, mm -hmm. everybody thinks that the NFL is impervious. If one, thing that, if one thing that this proves is that it's not impervious. So, in very much the typical manner of the NFL, who believes that they are arbiters of truth and right and, you know, the shield, their response... I found it actually really telling. Their response to a protest that was not about the anthem was to give you the black national anthem in addition to the other anthem in order to make it all equal. Which, dude, 
Pandering. For one game, too. I mean, it's just, I think it's just like for their first game of the season or some first nonsense. Of, pandering does not even begin. Like, yeah. I literally, when I found out about this, I was like, please, God, do not do that. <laughs> like, imagine I mean, being I, the fly on the wall when that was pitched. Oh, and my then God. Like, that sounds like a fantastic idea. Oh, my I mean, God. It's oh wonderful. My. We'll signal to everybody how much we're allies. We are woke. Yeah. NFL woke. <laughs> <laughs> By singing a damn song, you know what are you gonna do? You gonna sing uh, the swing low, sweet chariot next? Right, right. Oh my god! <clears throat> and it's just—I mean, it's just so hollow uh, mm-hmm. that really, I, I really found it to actually have what I think the opposite effect of what I, they exactly. I and that's what I want to say. I think it actually hurts the cause in general uh, absolutely because the, the, the it was misconstrued when people felt that the kneeling had anything to do with being anti-patriotic or being anti-flag or being anti-American. So now you've you've thrown more meat to the wolves because those same wolves that felt like you're disrespecting the flag are now saying, well, you know, that's, what about the, the, you know, what if we sang the white national anthem? Yeah, right, right. Of what if we sang a Nazi song? Right, uh, right, right. Or something, it's completely taking us further off the point. It really has, and, and it, it, it further off the point, and it acknowledges, and like I said, it acknowledges in no, in, you know, in no short manner, how they still do not get it. Right. So, like, we're sitting here talking about this. It only underscores that they didn't get it. They're actually responding to the thing they're not supposed to be responding to, and it's typical. But then I have this freaking. I got this game in my blood, and I can't, like, let it go. Right, Although, right. I got to tell you, when they were talking about making the guys stand, making them stand for the National Anthem, I was ready to go. Yeah. I, I, I was like, I right. pledged. I was like, if they make them do this, right. I'm out. Right, and I think Jerry Jones is one of the guys, uh, you know, kind of advocating for that. Or at least he of said that, that, he that was. The, <laughs> the Cowboys had to stand. And, and Yeah, <laughs> right, right. The Cowboys had to stand. I think oh, recently well. just something came out where the players are kind of, you know, that he hasn't made an official statement. He, he's been silent through this whole yep. thing. Surprise, and so surprise. Kind of like, you know, you'd hope that that's going to come across soon. And I just wonder, is there going to be a tipping point? Is there a certain point where as a player, where this is what your whole, I don't know, everything is, is based on, you know, are you willing to, you know, hit a tipping point where you say, well, if you don't say something, then we're, we're going to take action. And then what happens there? I mean, I, I don't see how they, the how do you know they're not going to have that. Uh, but you know, it's very interesting. It's like the money is a bit money is the big thing here. But the, the players are the product, and Jerry Jones doesn't have a team without them. So now I don't know what it's like in that locker room right now. Right. But they definitely have the power to make him say something. Now he may think he's impervious to it, and he may think that 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 brand is impervious to it. But I guarantee you. Those guys start talking, and he doesn't talk. It's going to be bad. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. He's not going to be able to withstand it. Something like that franchise that's you know has the moniker of America's team. You know <laughs> that that I think makes it even more impactful. You know, yeah. it carries more weight. I think. Yeah, I, I absolutely think it does. But I also know that that owner thinks he's above the world. He does, and so he feels like he can just weather it. But I think he's got some news coming. Right. How about Mahomes? Yo. Ten years. Hey, listen. I, I think I think the consensus is. So, so I was looking at some stats yesterday. Ten years ago, uh, the the top, you know, the top money makers in the league. I, I guess they were uh, Manning. They were Peyton Manning, and I think Brett Favre, and they were making fourteen million dollars a year. Okay. So now, if you think about what's going on here. This is forty million for ten. A this year is forty ten million years. a year for ten years. <laughs> ten years from now, that's going to be. I mean, peanuts. asking for fifty right. peanuts. Right. So it's really like right now. It's like you can have the tendency. It's like it sounds like oh my god, half a billion dollars. But dude, for the Kansas City, that is a, an incredible bargain. Right. So Five years has, from now, you could say you could be making four hundred million a year. <laughs> Absolutely, and and and, and the capital like, continues to go up. You know exactly. What I mean? That's the cap that's continues the to go up, right? And Mahomes is Mahomes has his his security. 
mm-hmm. but he also gives the team flexibility to bring things in around him. So he gets all, it's the best of all worlds for him. Mm-hmm. He gets the splash of, I got the biggest contract ever. He gets the flexibility of, I haven't hamstrung my team for 10 years. And he gets the promise of probably being the guy for at least 10 years. It's uh, a great deal for everybody. Well, think, think about it. I mean, when that contract is over, he'll only be 36. So right. <laughs> you could just like, what's the next step? You know what I mean? It makes you wonder. I mean, forget so, it. I mean, is, is, he, it, is he done? Because you're seeing all these players retire early. Does he say, you know what? I'm good. I did my thing. Or if he's playing, and I think, you know, uh, you can see this in a lot of folks who are like, they're past the money and they're like, how many championships can I right. win? It's a passion. Like, exactly. Like, I want to set the highest records. I want to do X, Y, and Z. When he can't, you know, at that point, he may not be able to throw that sidearm, you know, the way that he does or do this. You know, you just you see things that no one else has ever done. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I mean, one of the things that we get to claim uh, for him uh, is I'm a Met fan and have very welcome, little again to, to the club. be. Oh, yes, next right. yeah, so that's, that's Jorge, meet yes, Mike, yes. Mike, Mike Lee, Jorge. Yeah. yeah, right, exactly. Bobby Bonilla Day. Bobby Bonilla Day. Bobby Bonilla Day. But what, but what we do <laughs> get. Most to twist that knife every yeah. year. It's like one of the first people to say, Happy Bobby Bonilla Day. Oh, <laughs> but, goodness. but because uh, his father used to play for us, we get to claim a little of him, uh, Mahomes. So there we go. All right, I see the connection. Now we're, right. we're going we're gonna to get into our bullet round because. We want to try to keep this within our normal time frame. All right, hit it. Cam Newton to the Patriots and Brady to the Buccaneers. Is, is this, can 2020 get any weirder, or is that just I – mean, What are your nap, thoughts? I took a nap that day, woke up, and like after a half hour nap, and found that Cam Newton was a, was a Patriot, and I like bugged out. Dude, but here's the quick – he can do – he can make that team have another five years of incredible success. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I think it'll like, come down to – it all come for me is Brady and Belichick both want to know, can we do it without the other? Right. Mm-hmm. And Belichick is like, should you give me Cam Newton? Sure. Just give me the ring now. We're, we're I'm ready to win. And, and yep. Brady says, look at all the, he's never had, you know, weapons around him. There's like a, there's like two guys. And then the rest of it is turds that they polish. Right. Like yeah. guys you've never heard of, you would never hear of unless it was in that system. Right. So look at the proof either. I'm, I'm not will, a will New England fans, you know, and you know, I, 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 I know I want to segue back into Aunt Jemima. So I'm like, I'm like, saying, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to bring the race card back. But will New England fans, okay, we know that they're, let's just say they're racially conservative most of the time. Um, how are they going to react to all of Cam Newton's outfits and, and his uh, band, you know? His, so- <laughs> well, so if he wins, so, so there's a couple of things. They there. won't care. Okay. If if he wins, they won't. They've already started. Okay. Like I've, I've been listening. Like I was just in Rhode Island this weekend. Believe me, I've already heard this. <laughs> yeah. But but if he wins, yes. But here's the thing. Mm. He's got this one year contract. If he does win this year, they don't they don't pay guys. Yeah. So to 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 maybe if I re re redo my take on the five year plan. This is a – it's a platform for him. He may make them win. They may be able to clamor to get this guy back, but they won't pay him. Okay. Somebody else will, and he won't – he'll go. So he may have a this really successful one year. Done. Yeah. One and done. One That's and done. Mean. All right. One and done. So, Aunt Jemima, we're going to just, you know, <clears throat> we want to talk about Aunt Jemima and Avatar before we let you go. Those are, those are the two things. <laughs> why, are you trying to, why are you trying to light me up, man? <laughs> Oh, because we we got to bring it down to branding, and so we know that we know that you know uh, the real woman, right? She Nancy, she she went through this makeover where they they got rid of the handkerchief, and they thought that that was enough to kind of fix the box. But all of a sudden, we're we're you know George Floyd has made everybody kind of like hyper sensitive to race. I mean, I was literally on a Zoom call a few weeks ago when I first got to, to Florida, Florida office. Mm-hmm. I had terrible lighting. And I got on this networking event, and one of the one of the gentlemen, as soon as the, the show started, uh, the, the meeting started, he said to me, "You look Haitian," and I said, "What?" Because I because I was visibly in a what? dark room, right? So he said, "No," he said, "New location, new location." <laughs> <laughs> but I was so <laughs> I was so hyped on on race that all I heard was "You look Haitian," and 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 so we're we're all on edge. Yeah, like, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, definitely. We're, 
we're there's on a little bit of shell shock going on right now. There's we're no on edge. This is a lot to deal with. It's emotionally <laughs> exhausting. Um, and, and so now, uh, what are your thoughts on this whole thing with, with the packaging and, and just well, getting rid of it? I, I mean, listen, it, it, it only makes sense to you. Again, like, you know, it's really funny because we talk about the free market mm-hmm. and it's the free market, right, that we always say is the thing that's the bottom line. So when the free market speaks, yeah. you got to act. Right. So there's been a whole lot of years and years and years of ignoring this voice because you didn't think the voice had any real impact right? because you weren't selling to them or you weren't. It didn't, it didn't affect your bottom line. Mm-hmm. Or you might have think that it would affect the upper half of your bottom line negatively by paying attention to what you might see as the bottom part of your, uh, of your bottom line. Um, so it's necessary. When the, marketplace, when the marketplace cries out for a change, you either change or you get run over. And I think the pandemic heightened brands vulnerability Mm -hmm. and so if i can if i can put that in perspective i think they felt close to they were they felt close to the edge already and then they realized that they're out of place where you can't afford to ignore right what the marketplace is the marketplace is changing this is this coronavirus is going to be a thing that i can't ignore and i'm going to have to be able to talk to my customer in a manner that my customer needs to be spoken to. So if I'm reading the room and I look on my, uh, on my packaging and there's a mammy while <laughs> yeah. George, while George Floyd is getting his neck right. stomped on, this isn't a really difficult call. Right. I think, and I think that the, I think that the talk around it is disingenuous. If you're, if you are really who you, if you really are for your brand, if you really are talking about putting your services out or your product out for a general public, right. then this is a no brainer. Right. And, but see, my, my thing is, I it feel like it, a softball and it is. And, it is. and uh, the woman, the real woman's name, Nancy green, I think they could do uh, like a Betty Crocker move here and just, just, you know, keep, keep the family, keep, keep the, you know, I think there's a way out of this, but I think, my concern has been that we lose sight of the big kind of systemic changes and, and we get enamored with these small victories. But at the same time, a lot of people feel that this is long overdue. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize this as a small victory. It's been a hundred and something years. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize that as a small victory. The thing that it is, is like, as a person of color, you start to experience a level of Stockholm syndrome right. because you've been constantly so exposed to it that you don't even realize how messed up it is. Right. And I, I expressed that this morning at our staff meeting. There are things <laughs> that people of color that I think we, uh, it just gets exhausted that you just accept it. And it's part of the, it's, it's the dark side of the assimilation process because there are things that we're just, we get used to. Um, and, and it doesn't make them okay. Yeah, no, it does not make them all okay. Okay. And I think one of the things I want to like hold up for the millennials about and the, and the zennials about is their ability to actually understand that and start to shake the floor for some change. Right. Where all we were doing was squirrel trying to get a nut. Right. They're doing that and trying to shake up the world. So props. Right. Absolutely. Now, Avatar, this is what we've all been waiting for. We're going to close out our show with this because I personally love the movie. I, I, I used to own a 3D TV up, and I had the 3D goggles and I got the 3D Avatar you know, <laughs> DVD. I was in love with Zoe Zaldana's character for like months afterwards to the point where I was starting to think like a blue baby wouldn't be such a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just so yeah. I'm a fan. I think I think I, uh, Jorge's gonna is gonna give you his input. But why is it that you hate this movie? Oh my god! I mean, just my blood is boiling just thinking about <laughs> it. You know, I went to see this movie with my mother. I was I, I was I was visiting North Carolina with my mother lives. I went to see it with my mother, 
And about a third of the way through it, I leaned over to her and I said, this is killing me. <laughs> it is the most, uh, you want to talk about pandering. This is, it because, is it because the, the mother, uh, you know, the, the, the matriarch was Jamaican, obviously? Oh, 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 oh. oh no, there's, so <laughs> ma- there's so much. Like, they do all of these tropes. They did the colonizer. All the, the colonizer. <laughs> the whole story is Pocahontas. <laughs> That's the story. They just dressed it up with these, oh, my God. And the pandering to the environment yeah. with the tr- where they're, like, plugged into the trees. I mean, right. like, you plugged into the trees, <laughs> dude. I, when I was watching it, I could not believe it with each passing thing, and then that ridiculous denouement where they were like with the bad guy who was so ridiculous in the robot suit and all yes, this. It was so stupid. <laughs> like I really felt like my, I was getting stupider while I was watching it. And, <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you honestly. Technically, it was it was wonderful to look at. Gorgeous! I think, I think it's still one of the best looking Blu-rays that's ever been released. I mean, I, it's of, still I, wonderful, but man, you better, you better be able to tell me a story that's not what I haven't heard for a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> well, but isn't that part of our our, our, <clears throat> our cinematic universe? Is that we retell stories? There are classic the hero's stories journey that, has been retold a million times. I mean, yeah, okay. Well, let's say I'll pay lip service to that. Yes. <laughs> Let's say I know that that's the case, but damn, this one is so heavy handed. It's like it didn't do any real work in thinking about how to retell the story. It's just, oh, let's do Pocahontas, dress it up real. And the thing that really bothers me is how it, they believe, like, what are they going to make, like eight more? Now, it's been like 10 years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I think that that time has passed, man. That 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 party is over. I will say that I think that's probably what impacts people about this movie. If they had been a little bit more humble about it, but they came in kind of saying, this is the most tour de force thing you'll, your eyeballs will ever be well, blessed with seen. seeing, right? And it's James Cameron, and you know, there's a lot to be said about him. Oh. So I get it. Like, if they had been more humble and then just been like, hey, here's, here's this story we're retelling, it wouldn't have been as bad, I think. Yeah, like, I mean, I think that's probably... You know, that has a lot to do with the perception of it. Um, I think there's probably something to be said for that. But, I mean, yes, Cameron is just, he's, he's, he's so obnoxious to begin with. And then when you put, you lay that on top of the Pocahontas story, on top of the racial tropes, on top of <laughs> the, Africa, the, yeah, like the, the environmental the resources, tropes. Yeah. yeah, right, right. It's just like, ugh, okay, exhausted. So, oh. no, I, I will not be seeing Avatar 2. Oh, no. Avatar 5? Because they got... Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All uh, right, Mike. Well, this has been a blast. We're going to have to do it again uh, uh, very well, soon. Well, it really was a lot of fun, man. You know, this is, it's, it's, uh, it's obviously it's great to see you. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's great to uh, kind of reminisce and... Uh, and talk about the, the stuff that's going on today. Well, yeah, absolutely. Now, tell us, tell, tell our listeners how they can reach you, uh, you know, and, and where to find you. And, and yeah, you yeah. Well, uh, uh, you know, uh, Polygon, like I said, even though uh, I've been doing much, focusing much more on PI work now, and we'll talk about that some other time. Well, what's the private investigator? <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Oh, yeah. you, you got to talk. I, I, let's, let's, this is the extended cut. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, <laughs> uh, actually a guy that I used to work with at, uh, at Acclaim uh, started a PI business, but, you know, he's like a big white guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of times they need a black person <laughs> to get into places where he would obviously be noticed. So about like four or five years ago, I started uh, doing surveillance uh, in the places where they couldn't really show up. Okay. Uh, so I just was doing that on the side for fun, really, just mm-hmm. kind of like for fun. You know, a Sunday with no football, I'll go hang out in the church and, you know, take some video. Um, <laughs> because basically it's more, you know, it's mostly about, uh, you know, insurance claims, you know. Gotcha. Uh, but uh, I've turned to kind of doing it full time. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's incredible, man. It's just like uh, we have this really great business uh, doing social media. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, because people are really dumb when they're trying to rip the when they're trying to rip their insurance companies off, <laughs> and um, 
Uh, that's a big part of it. Uh, you know, process serving, um, like I said, surveillance, interviews, like all these disciplines, court, courthouse stocks, all these disciplines that go involved that are involved with this, and all of it has this level of kind of puzzle solving and game playing that fits into my personality. And I was like, you know, I'm looking to make a change. Yeah. Let me put some. Let me put some. Uh, let me put some energy into this. Well, awesome, awesome. Well, get, tell our readers like how to how to follow you on Twitter and yeah, yeah. So you can yeah, you can follow me on uh, Twitter uh, at uh, at NYC Mike WP. And uh, same thing on uh, Facebook, NYC Mike WP. Uh, I'm always good for a rant. You'll always see something interesting there. Uh, you can always stop by the Polygon Dropout uh, dot com website, which is Polygon Dropout dot com. And uh, yeah, I'm around. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks for joining us, Mike. Jorge, it's been great to have you uh, back on the show as co-host, and, and thank you, everyone out there, for listening. This is Ramon Peralta with Peralta Design. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Mission Control. Once again, this is Ramon Peralta with Peralta Design, and we launch brands. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you for taking this journey with us. To learn more about Peralta Design and our work, Go to www.peraltadesign.com and subscribe to keep up with the crew.